Hello, dog lover. My name is Saro. I'm a dog trainer, also coach dog owners. And in this live video, we are going to talk about the challenges that you have with your dog and your dog training. And I'm also going to answer your questions live. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask those questions in the chat line. And also, if you want to have a mini consultation session with me for free, you can use the super chat option where I'm going to help you actually to deal with whatever issue that you have uh, live in this session one-on-one -on -one with you and help you to deal with that issue that you have with your dog and overcome it. So if that sounds like something that you want to work on and have uh, have a, an opportunity to, to get a sample of how it works, you can use the super chat option in the chat area and go from there. Um, so in this live video session, I want to first of all start uh, to talk about some of the challenges that I think many dog owners are facing when it comes to training their dogs or uh, having a dog in general. Uh, so one of them, for example, is that I don't have time to train my dog. That's very common uh, challenge, common issue that dog owners are facing. So I'm going to explain to you how you can make time and have uh, an opportunity to actually train your dog uh, without sacrificing um, much. We'll discuss that. Uh, the other one is I don't know what to do when my dog does this or does that or behaves like this or behaves like that. Um, or the common, very common other one is that how do I train my dog? So we'll discuss all these challenges and yourself, if you have any challenges that you can, you're facing at the moment, uh, let me know in the chat area and I will help you as well. So let's start with the cha challenge number one that I think is very common in, in dog owners is that I don't have time to train my dog. The issue of not having time is, could be because you are not dedicating uh, your, your, or dividing your time proper, properly over everything that you do in your life. Now, when it comes to dogs and dog training, you have to uh, somehow include some form of um, time to put for training. So what does that will look like? That will look like such as maybe devoting one day a week, maybe to train your dog, maybe uh, two or three days a week to train your dog, maybe every day to train your dog. So what you want to do is you want to come up with a plan, some form of plan that you can say, you know what, I'm going to dedicate this time and day to train my dog on this day, at this time, at such a, uh, at such a you know, either in the morning or in the evening or in the afternoon or whenever I get a chance, I will dedicate the time to uh, train my dog. That is as simple as putting, you know, that time and day to in your calendar. Could be, again, one day a week. Could be two or three days a week. Could be every day. As long as you put it in your calendar, right? So as long as you put it in your calendar, then it becomes reality. Then it becomes something that you're going to say, you know what, I'm going to do it because I put it in my calendar and it's part of uh, my day. So that itself gives you the first trigger to actually do the training. Now, when you're putting that time to train your dog, it doesn't have to be hours. It could be as short as 15 minutes a day at the time. Let's say if you're going to train your dog one day a week and you're going to do only for 15 minutes, that still is better than nothing. If you're going to do two or three days a week, 
and you just dedicate 15 minutes, that's 45 minutes a week of training. If you're going to do it every day, that's even better. But one thing that I would say and suggest and would recommend is um, don't do it every day. It, it becomes too much uh, of uh, mental stimulation for a dog. In, to the point that it becomes challenging for your dog to learn and focus. And also it becomes a little bit too challenging for you to do every day. So I would suggest maybe two or three days a week, 15 minutes a session. Okay. Um, let me just mute myself for a minute. For a second, I'll be right Uh, so what I would suggest is to do what I usually do myself is whenever I get a chance, I train my dog. So, for example, if I'm working out, during the workout, I will train my dog. If I'm going for a walk, I would train my dog. Uh, if I'm going for to do something that involves... Uh, me having a little bit of fun and work and a little bit of free time, I would add that too. If I'm working in the office, uh, I would do training with my dog. Now, I'm going to explain what training exactly it should be and looks like so you have a better idea of what I mean by training. And in near future, I'm going to do a video where I'm working out and my dog is being trained at the same time. So stay tuned for that video. That just that would just give you an example of what what I mean when I say whenever you could add some training to your whatever you're doing do, during the the activities that you're doing, you just add a little bit of training in there. So training could be done anytime, any place, anywhere in a way, but I suggest you to train your dog at home where your dog is nice and comfortable, relaxed. You are relaxed as well. There's no other distractions happening in the, in the environment. So you can focus on training your dog, right? Uh, but you wanna make sure that you're dedicating that 15 minutes session of training. Why am I suggesting 15 minutes? Because five minutes is too short. 10 minutes is not enough. 15 minutes is perfect. 15 minutes is ideal time for any dog to learn and practice something, right? So what, what, what I mean by training your dog for 15 minutes is something like this. So I'm gonna share my screen. Just give me a moment. Um, I'm gonna share the screen. So it's gonna look like this, okay, when I say training my dog. So training a dog, it doesn't have to be like, you know, set in stone or be in a way uh, something that you're, you're preparing too much, you're doing too much, you're stressing yourself. Training session is just basically, this right you're just asking your dog to sit stay and come for example you're just practicing those now if your dog knows more than that what you do you just add those uh, cues to the dog as well to during the training you know lie down uh, stand heal you can all do all those things right it doesn't have to be very uh, you know structured soldier like training i don't recommend that it has to be fun it has to be in a way something that you enjoy doing it something that your dog prefers for example here uh, i did seven to like i'm doing a 15 minute dog training training my dog uh, seven to eight minutes of it was on the leash we just i teach my dog the other seven or eight minutes what I do, I just practice it using play. 
So I'm playing with my dog. During the play, we are repeating those commands that she learned eight minutes ago, and we practice it. That's how training should be. You know, half of it you're teaching, half of it you're practicing using play and praise. Now, because I use play and praise as a reward system to train my dog, it's very fun. It's very, um, it goes very smoothly. It goes very fast. So for 15 minutes, we're just having fun, right? Now, just imagine, for example, I'm working out and I'm doing this, right? I can work out and do this as well. I can work out, and during the, my workout, I can ask her to sit, stay, down, all those commands, practice those, and then pl play with her too. So simple yet effective. Make it simple. So for 15 minutes a day, let me know in the chat area, is 15 minutes of training your dog session, is it too much or is it enough? Is it something that is realistic? Is it something that you can add to your day? Can you, let me know in the chat area, can you add 15 minutes of training one day a week or two or three days a week to your routine? To your active to your active life that you have to, add, to your busy life that you have is it something that you can do let me know in the chat area yes or no let me know it's something that you have to be able to enjoy as well as i said right so training is not that Dang. hard you're just what you're doing basically you're just teaching and practicing right so if you dedicate 15 minutes a day, boom, you're good, right? Now, how do how the other common question get, I get is what do I do with when my dog does this or does that? And I'm sure some of the questions that you have in the chat area is is similar to the the challenges that you have. And I'm going to answer those questions in the chat area, but I want to give you an overall understanding and look of what do you do when your dog it doesn't listen to you or does this or does that so overall if your puppy or your dog is doing something that is unwanted and you are having challenges with your dog and it's hard for you all you have to think of it that okay i am the blame here, it's not my f dog's fault. That I want you to really understand, that your dog is not doing whatever it's doing to piss you off. It's not planning that to piss you off. It's not planning to do that to ruin your life or your day, okay? It's not your dog's fault, it's your fault. Now, why am I blaming you or the human instead of the, the dog? because the dog is reflection of what the human provides or does. If you do what you have to do as a dog owner, your dog wouldn't misbehave, wouldn't do what, um, what you think is doing, is misbehavior. Now, what do I mean by if you do your part? So let me share the screen again. So if you provide your dogs daily five essential needs, which are exercise, training, socialization, care, and then affection, and if you provide it in this order, I guarantee you, your dog wouldn't bother you, wouldn't come up with behaviors, unwanted behaviors, wouldn't give you crap, wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't misbehave overall. Now, what do I mean by if you provide these five things? So think of it this way. You as a person yourself, think of it from your point of view. What do you need on daily basis to be healthy, happy, and an, ind an individual who's satisfied. 
think of it that way. I'm going to use myself as an example, okay, and see if you relate or see if you can come up with your own things that you need to be satisfied, okay? So I need coffee. I need to go for a walk every day. I need my lunch. I need good sleep. I need my car. I need my phone. I need my computers. I need my uh, camera to record videos. Uh, I need my job. I need dogs. I need my wife. I need mm, my dogs, my own dogs. Uh, I need house. I need a car to go and come from work and do my things. You see, I can go on and on. The list gets longer and longer. I need all those things in order for me to have a healthy, happy, productive day. Now, your dog, in other hand, doesn't need coffee, doesn't need a car, doesn't need um, wife or husband or <laughs> this and that. All it needs is exercise, training, socialization, care, and affection. Believe it or not, that's what your dog needs. Those are the five things that your dog needs. They don't need material stuff. They don't need shiny good stuff. They do not need the most expensive color or the bed or fancy food or water ball, fancy this, fancy that. They don't crave those. What they crave is you providing them their daily proper amount of exercise. They need daily training. Yes, they need training. What is training? You're saying what that they need. Why is it that they need training? Training is communication system and interaction connect uh, 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 interaction system with you and your dog. That's all it is. Your dog needs to learn how to communicate to you, and you need to learn how to communicate to your dog, and you need to have a way of interacting with your dog. And if you don't interact with your dog, your dog says, then what's the point of me living with you? I, I am designed, bred by humans, for humans, to interact with humans. And if you're not interacting with me and you're not training me, then what's the point of me living, right? They need socialization. Every dog, from my experience, is a social animal. Those who become desocialized or antisocial is because of the human not providing proper social socialization opportunities for the dog to socialize. They also need care. Of course, they need care. And they also need affection. Of course, they need affection. But care and affections are not the main things. They need those as well, but those are not the main things that they focus on. The human is the one who focuses on mainly on care and affection. The human forgets about providing exercise, training, socialization for the dog as well. So your day should be focused on providing these five daily essential needs for your dog in order for your dog to be healthy, happy, and not misbehave. Simple as that. That's the general idea of how do I stop my dog from doing this or how do I stop my dog from doing that or how do I train my dog, which is, a, okay, how to train your dog is a different question, but you need to train your dog. You need to exercise your dog properly. You need to provide socialization, care, and affection. If you do that, you will have a good, well-behaved dog who's not going to bother you, is not going to cause headaches and issues for you. I hope that makes sense. Uh, and I'm going to refer to this formula over the course of the, the live session. So let me go to quickly to question area and the chat area and ask you answer your questions. So the first one is from Angie Anderson. 
uh, says thank you you are well welcome uh, what to do after no does not stop the behavior how to intervert uh, uh, apparently uh, uh, appropriately start over or stop this is a good question let me explain what the question is actually if you don't, you're not understanding what the question is <clears throat> so in my training system what I usually suggest to do, or what I do in general, is I first thing I fir first thing I teach my dog is yes and no. Yes means good girl, good dog, good boy. Yes, you're doing everything right, very good. And no means oh, you didn't do good, you failed at it. That's not good. Uh, I don't want that behavior. So I teach this to my dogs, to any dog. Because if you don't teach the right and wrong, wrong, then we can't train the dog. The dog has to know the yes and no's. So no is a behavior or is a is a communication system, a cue to a dog that we are saying verbally, and we teach this to a dog to respond to it. So when we say no, the dog stops. So. Let me show you an example of what I mean by uh, I uh, what I mean by when I say no. Uh, let me share this screen with you. Um, I think this will do. Hold on. Some reason it's not going. I have one of those dogs actually. Dogs naturally like this, which is not natural. So a uh, seeker uh, do its own thing. She has the option of going wherever. No. And so there is on the leash. there is an example. And if she gets too far or too out of control, I can step on the leash. Annie, no. Annie, no. Come on. Go, go. Yeah. Okay, so that was a sample of what I mean by no, right? So I'm verbally correcting my dog. I'm saying don't do that, right? So you have to be able to uh, verbally uh, tell your dog that is doing something wrong or verbally you have to be able to tell your dog that is doing something right. So when you teach this to your dog and your dog doesn't respond to the no and doesn't stop the behavior, what do you do, right? That's the question. How do you stop the dog if the dog doesn't listen to your no? So the answer to that is if, your dog, if you have done your part of teaching your dog the verbal cues of no properly and your dog has properly learned, first of all, you're not going to have that issue because if you have done it properly, then your dog is going to respond to it no matter what happens. Now, if your dog is not responding properly to no, that means it's still learning. So you have to repeat that more for your dog to learn and be better at it. Right, so that means that your dog is not ready yet, is not qualified, first of all, to be off leash, and two, maybe it hasn't learned that this Q word of no means anything to me. So you have to repeat more and more and more until your dog learns that behavior. Now, there are two ways that you can teach the no to your dog. Um, one of them is by playing. I mean, all of them is by playing. You play with your dog um, mm -hmm. and you're, you're teaching your dog that if you do this or if you do that, um, you, will, you will get the correction. So for example, in here, uh, in this video clip because I know if I play the sound, it's not going to play properly. So I'm going to just voice over it in this video so you have an understanding. So see, I'm holding the ball. 
and I'm saying no. So the dog just pauses, right? So what that means is the dog is saying, okay, I can't move, I can't do anything in this case uh, until the human gives me the cue of go get it, right? So I play with the dog and I say, if you stop that behavior, whatever you're doing, you know? So she loves, for example, this dog loves the ball. So I'm saying, calm down slow down so the dog lies down slows down and if if she does that then the play continues if not i say no until she stops the behavior and i hold the ball until the dog has completely understood that if i stop then the game is going to go on if i don't stop if i don't relax if i don't uh break the command the game is not going to start. So I better listen to this uh, command. So as you can see, I'm pushing the dog in here. I'm saying, don't move. Learn to pause and lie down until I give you the clue uh, and or the cue of moving. Right? So that itself makes the dog to understand that if, if I don't listen to the human, so you see, I'm holding the ball and the dog is lying down, nice and relaxed, doesn't move until I say go, right? So let me see. No, no. So no, no. means release the release the ball. Release the ball. Good, release the ball. Good girl, good girl. And then right. go get it. So you can do this as often as you can. So that's how I teach. That's how I teach the no to the dog. Right. So once the dog learns that cue, then I understand that. OK, I, I feel whenever I feel that the dog has understood what no means, then I will implement it in every situation so that that I can practice that more and more. Uh, and then the dog learns that, okay, if I do something wrong, whatever it is, I hear the no, I stop. So I'll give you an example. So years ago, Harvey, I used to take him to the park and he was off leash. He was off leash trained, first of all. So that's why I was off leashing him. So I had off leash him off leashed him, but the only thing was that he used to pick up sticks on the walks and chew, work on them and chew on them. And I didn't want him to do that, right? And he was about 30 feet away from me, right? So instead of me yelling at my dog and saying, hey, stop it, don't, don't chew on that, you bad dog, stop it, stop doing all this weird stuff, right? and being ridiculous and being, and looking like I'm yelling at my dog and my dog is hearing yelling from me. Instead of all these, I replaced it by saying, Harvey, no. And Harvey would drop the stick. I didn't have to go through anything to correct my dog, right? Uh, and my dog was responding to me just by a simple no. That's because I repeated playing with my dog and my dog learned it and we put it into action. By the way, you can learn all these in my online course. I, if you are not local and you want to learn all these, and you want to learn how to correct your dog, how to train your dog without the use of treats or food, aversive tools, force or domination, you learn it on my online course. If you are local and you are living near where I am and you want to learn this, you can come, uh, you can join my private training. But if you are somewhere in the world that unfortunately we are not in the same location, then you have the opportunity to join one of my online courses. I recommend the functional dog training. And also I have a shorter version of that, which is basic six-week online basic obedience training course. You can 
register to any of those. If you have a puppy, you can register to my puppy training course and get all these, you know, learn exactly what I'm teaching, right? I also have a Zoom training as well. You can learn all these on my website, which is sorrowdogtraining.com. Uh, if you want to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, visit sorrowdogtraining.com. So hopefully that made sense. So, you know, saying no, first of all, to your dog is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. I prefer saying no to my dog than yelling at my dog. Then getting physical and angry and do stupid things. It changes everything. When, when when you learn this and when you implement it to your dog, it changes everything. Uh, let's go to the next question from Jack. It says, how to get rid of tick? Hmm. That's something that you can literally uh, Google it or you know YouTube it, <laughs> and it will show you exactly how to do it. Um, I haven't dealt with it. I ha Yes, I have actually. Um, in the beginning when I didn't know what I was supposed to do, I removed it and unfortunately the head st stayed in the, in the dog and that wasn't good. You're supposed to, the way you're supposed to remove it is you're supposed to remove the entire uh, body of the, the tick. Uh, you have to learn how to do it so you can, yeah, watch a YouTube video that will help you how to do it. That is actually, uh, yeah, I would recommend to do that instead. Uh, Francesca, Francesca is saying my, Francesco, sorry, Francesco. My collie is a year and a half old and is afraid to walk to park. I'm not a quiet residential, uh, I'm not on a quiet residential street. Yes, that is a challenge. One thing that I want you to, first of all, from your question that you're asking, one thing that I want you to learn, first of all, the very first thing is I look at first the dog, the breed, and then let's say your dog's name is Rover, and then I look at Rover. So let me explain what that is. It will make sense. So the dog. A dog, in general, they are not, it is not natural for them to walk in environments that there's too much stimulation. In the park, on the streets, in general, dogs are not meant to walk in environments that has a lot of stimulation. That's one thing I want you to understand, okay? That's number one. Now the breed, the collie. Collies are, I have one, not, well, Annie is collie cross, right? Uh, collies are sensitive breeds. What that means is that they, they, they pay a lot of attention to their environment. They're always aware of what's going on. And that's part of the breed. That's the reason we bred them. You know, we bred collies to do that. We want them to, um, we want them to be sensitive to the surroundings. We want them to be aware of what's going on because we use them as working breed, working dog type of dog that we use them for specific tasks. And that requires we, in the human wanted the dog to be specifically sensitive. So you're dealing with a sensitive breed. So you're dealing with a dog who doesn't want to be in an environment, first of all, that is there's too much stimulation. All dogs, they don't want to live or be in an environment that has too much stimulation. It's just too much for them. And then on top of that, you have a breed who's very sensitive, right? That 
also deters them from walking in an environment that it, it's, it's too much for them. Now, your own dog, you didn't mention your dog's name. Uh, I'm going to call it Rover. Uh, Rover is, unfortunately, is one of those, has all these aspects, plus probably didn't have a good opportunity to socialize and be desensitized with the environments, different environments, different uh, sur surroundings, different um, places, different people maybe, different objects, yeah. Um, so what we want to make sure is go back to basics and restart doing the formula that I just shared with you. What is that formula? It's exercise, providing your dogs daily five essential needs. Again, you see, I told you I'll bring this back. <laughs> um, you have to go back to basics. You have to provide proper amount of exercise for your dog. Francesca, Francesco, here's what I mean. So if you have a dog who's afraid to walk in the park or is you live in a residential area that is very busy, You'd, I'd rather not to put your dog in that environment until we have a good dog who's healthy and normal, then we can put that dog in that environment. So I'd rather not to walk this dog until then, until we have figured it out. So, because if you're walking your dog in an environment like that and you're uh, flooding the dog, do you know what flooding is? Flooding is putting a lot of uh, stimula stimulation on the brain of the individual to eventually say, you know, I give up, which is not a good thing. It, it may, sometimes it works in human psychology, but in dog psychology, it usually doesn't work. Uh, so you don't want to flood your dog or bombard the dog with that environment or stimulation or stimuli that is causing that to happen. So I'd rather not to put that dog in that environment than do anything else, right? Because most dog trainers or most behaviorists would say, you gotta flood the dog. I don't agree with that. I've seen the negative results of it. I. I don't want to put that dog in that situation because that doesn't help. It, you see, if you put the dog in that environment and you force the dog to walk in that environment, the dog is going to shut down and you're just physically traumatizing the dog more and more. So I'd rather not to walk the dog until I have uh, accomplished this formula. So what do we replace the exercise with? The exercise can be at home, for example, or in the backyard where the dog is comfortable and familiar, and we can physically exercise the dog. So, for example, if you follow, if you're following my channel and you are you are seeing the way I train dogs, right? Let me go back to that video. Hold on, just give me a second. So if you are seeing me, if you have seen me, how I train dogs, let me bring you this one. That one of my latest videos, okay? This is how, how, would, how I would physically train a dog at home, right? Physically. This is exercise in the physical term. So if I need to exercise my dog and I don't have, and it's raining outside and it's, and it's pouring uh, pouring rain and it's snowing out there or it's horrible out there or in your case the dog park or the park or in general outside uh, causes problem with your dog this is how i would do i would do physical uh, training at home so this is called physical stimulation right so you do that right and then that's exercise training and as you could see while i was exercising the dog i was training it too 
So I'm hitting two birds at once. Unfortunately, I don't, I don't like to use that term, but that's I'm throwing two rocks at once. Let's say that I'm training physically and I'm training my dog mentally. So that's basically what it is. You want to exercise your dog physically and mentally. Physically should be 30%, mentally should be 70%. So if you do that, you're good to go. You have provided proper exercise for your dog. You have provided proper training for your dog as well. And then you can use the exercise and training that you have provided for your dog and help your dog to be socialized. So, for example, your dog is having a hard time walking in the park and everything else is bothering it, right? That's because your dog is lacking social skills, is lacking those skills to deal with this situation. So if you train, exercise and train your dog properly, then you can help your dog to socialize. So what I mean by that is, if you are able to teach your dog to exercise your dog so your dog physically and mentally is stimulated and then train your dog so the, your dog learns A, B, C, D and then start writing uh, words. I can walk. I can do. And then starts making sentences, for example, and then starts writing a book. Then all this knowledge can be used to help the dog to solve this problem, which is socialization. Am I making sense or what? Right? So you want to make sure that you're doing, you're following this formula and then share care and then affection. So I'm not saying that you're, Francesco, you're doing this, but probably because your dog is having a hard time and is afraid to walk in the park and it gets uh, stressed by uh, residential streets, uh, noises and activities, what do you do? You share affection. You say, oh my goodness, my dog is stressed and uh, this. Uh, and then you share affection. Right? So you're doing the the process you're going from backwards you're starting from affection that's not that shouldn't be your first step your first step should be exercise training socialization and then care after you've done all these then you share affection but most people with dogs who have issues such as being afraid or being anxious or stressed or things like that, the first step of theirs is affect sharing affection. They think that will solve the problem or make it easier. So they focus on affection. Oh, my poor dog. Oh, oh my goodness is doing this or uh, that. And then is going through this. Oh, oh, let me give you food. Let me give you treats that may, may help you. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. You, you're good. No socialization. Okay, you're afraid of those. No, we're not going to do that. Uh, sit, sit. That's what they do. They sit, sit, sit. Oh, you're not sitting. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. You're not sitting. Okay, forget it. Uh, let, let me just uh, play fetch with you for five, ten minutes. And that's, that you, that's usually how the, the case goes. I'm just giving you an, an example, extreme example. But that's how it is, right? They, you have to follow this formula properly and in this order. If you do that, you will see that your dog is going to be able to solve the problem and walk without any problem. I wish you were near where I, would, I was living and working so I could help you personally. But that's the way I would approach it. Yeah. Hope that helps, uh, Francesco. The next question is from Owen. What do you think of extra large bullies? <laughs> well, depend on depends on your dog's size. 
I don't know how how big is it, it is your dog. Um, you just have to give your dog the right size of bullets. Uh, I mean, if you have a beagle, I, I give uh, a size. Let me show you. So this is the size that I give to my beagles. Okay. Uh, here. That's how we, you see my hand. I don't have a big hand, but that's how it how it size, looks like. Uh, that's the size I would give to a beagle. If I have a smaller dog than beagle, yeah, this will work still. But uh, if you have a big dog, um, if you have a big dog, uh, then you want to get a bigger dog, bigger bullies. Uh, it all depends, right? Uh, so this, for example, is this brand that I use, and I'm not promoting it or anything, but this is what I use myself. It's a real chew for dogs. It's all natural um, and grass-fed, free-range beef. Okay, so that's the one that I use myself. So just so just so you know. Um, hope that helps. Right. Let's go to next question, Robbie. Hi, Saro. I think 15 minutes a day, three days a week is a very doable. I agree. Uh, but I have been working with my boy 10 minutes once a day, every day. Too much. Um, it's not too much if you train it my way, if you train it my method of dog training. But if you're doing any other way, it may be too much. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can show you an example of, uh, like, you know, my training, my training system. Um, I'm going to, hold on, give me a, give me a minute. Let me just find one. Uh, not that one. Uh, okay. Give me a minute. I'll be right with you. Okay. So let's say I'm training my dog. There is the video. Let me see if I can find it. Give me a minute. Let me just find it. Uh, okay, I'm going to use this. I'm going to use this video. Uh, let's use this video. So if I'm training my dog, if I'm using this method, 10 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day is not too much. It's good. Because we're playing. We're interacting. We're playing. We're having a good time. We're uh, having fun. There's no, uh, uh, there's no stress going on, right? Uh, but when you're training a dog using treats or food or anything like that, there is a stress going on. I guarantee you. Wh why is that? Uh, because when you're using treats to train a dog, you're actually training your dog. But when you're using my method of dog training, which is using play and praise reward system, your dog doesn't know that it's being trained. But from human's point of view, I'm training my dog. But from my dog's point of view, she or he, the dog doesn't have any clue that is being trained. All it sees and all it feels is that is interacting with me is playing with me and I'm playing with her or the dog. That's all it, all it experiences. It's a positive uh, experience. It doesn't feel like training because again, there's no stress happening in here. Right? Let me hide the question so you can see. So, there is no stress happening in here. The dog is not saying that, oh, uh, I'm not getting my treat, or, oh, where did the treat go? Or, uh, oh, you're, you're not happy with me uh, because I didn't sit, uh, or you're not happy with me because 
uh, it seems like you know you're uh, you're you're angry because I didn't sit, right? You 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 get angry because your dog doesn't sit. In in here you can see like you know first of all I don't get angry because there is no way that my dog is gonna fail at what I'm teaching. There's no way. The dog, as long as it's having fun, and because it's having fun, wants to continue having fun, will do exactly what you're asking it to do. But in its mind, in dog's mind, it doesn't do it because it's being trained. It does it because it wants to make you happy. It wants to get you um, satisfied. Because if I'm satisfied, the game goes on. If I'm not satisfied, no game happens. So my, my approach is to have a fun environment and fun opportunity to interact with my dog. And my dog's goal is to make me happy because my dog naturally has been born and bred and designed to satisfy the human. Understanding this little trick, little uh, secret, it'll change the way you look at dog training. So overall, uh, again, 15 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day, if you're doing it my way, my dog training, no, every day is a good day. But if you're using treats to train your dog, I would suggest maybe once a week because you don't want to put your dog into stress mode. It stresses the dog. You know, most dog owners, they don't see that. They don't notice that. Next time when you're training your dog using treats, look at signs of stress in your dog. And I guarantee you, you'll see them. That's a different subject to talk about, but I want you to look at that way. If, you're, if your dog is having fun, it's not training. If your dog is not having fun and you're getting pissed and you're getting stressed and you're getting frustrated because your dog doesn't sit, doesn't do this, doesn't do that, doesn't listen to you during the training, that's not training. And if you do that too much, you're stressing your dog. But if you're having fun, your dog is having fun, it could be half an hour a day, every day doesn't really matter. Uh, thank you for you, your training sessions. I really enjoyed them. What would you recommend and how to train when the dog is reactive to other dogs? Uh, this is, again, you know, I want to refer back to uh, the formula. Let me share with you the formula. Why is it that do a dog is reactive to other dogs? Because, can you guess why is it that a dog is reactive to another dog? L looking at this formula, can you guess why is it that a dog is reactive to other dogs? Let me know in the chat area if you know the answer. I'll give you a minute while I have a sip of coffee. Why is it that a dog is reactive to other dogs? When you look, look at it, this look at this formula. When you look at this formula, what clue comes to your mind? What do you what do you think? When your dog is reacting to other dogs, what is lacking? Uh, MN, uh, uh, MN Conet, now Conet, how would you say that? Uh, MNA Conet, it says, I guess, socialization. Very good, so very good guess, actually. Yes, it is lack of socialization.
If a dog is reacting to other dog, that means is lacking social skills, right? I I usually uh, use this example. It's like you know, if you don't teach your kids or any person how to greet other people, they may go and punch the other person. Hey, how you doing? Boom, boom. How's it going? Right? There are people who do that actually. They punch you and you know smack you when they're greeting. That's not the way to greet. You have to teach people or kids. You ha- you shake hands. Unfortunately, these days we don't shake hands. We bump hands. Bump, right? You bump hands and you, hi, how are you doing? How's it going, right? That's how we greet other humans, for instance. Dogs, if you don't teach them, if you don't train them the social skills, that's what they do. They get reactive to other dogs. So how do we solve this? I just explained on the issue of fear, a dog who's being fearful, right? So you have to go back to basics. A dog who's reactive to other dogs, that means it's stressed as well. Dogs are stressing your dog, right? So instead of putting your dog in an environment that there are other dogs and stress your dog more, I would reduce that option. I would reduce that opportunity for the dog to get stressed, first of all. And I'll start working on exercising my dog properly. How do I exercise my dog properly? I will go, for example, to parks or environments or places that there are no dogs, but I yet I can walk my dog and physically exercise my dog. If I have to drive somewhere and take my time to prepare and plan, I will do that. I would go and Google map it, find a park that there's no dogs and no people around, and I'll drive there and I'll walk my dog uh, at least an hour a day, twice a day for 30 minutes each, so I can give my dog that physical stimulation that he needs. Now, the next part would be training, which is mental stimulation. And as I've shown you some videos here and there, that's how I would train my dog. I would train my dog. Um, um, let me find the video. Uh, some examples. Uh, I would train my dog. Right? Uh, I, would, I would train it physically and mentally, and stim- stimulate it physically and mentally. I would take it for walks. Uh, I would put it on a long leash. Uh, I would uh, do all kinds of stuff, right, to get my dog physically and mentally stimulated, okay? Uh, And then I'll use what I have created for, let's say, a month or two. I've done this. Now my dog is, is ready to learn the next Thing, which is socialization. So I'll teach my dog, hey, now that you know, for example, sit, stay, for example, you know what sit means, you know what stay means. So we're going to approach a dog. I want you to listen to me and uh, respond to my command of sit and stay. So when you see other dogs, you sit and stay instead of reacting. So I'm replacing the unwanted emotion, unwanted behavior, unwanted social skill with wanted social skill. So I'm telling my dog, when you see other dogs, calm down and sit and stay so that dog can socialize with you and you can socialize with the other other dog. Because remember, when your dog is seeing another dog, it goes, right, behaves like that, right? Wants to uh, react, and it reacts and attacks your dog, other dog. So other dog sees your dog, says, "Uh oh, this guy is coming to, uh, you know, throw me a punch. So I'm going to get ready and throw a punch back, right? So your, your dog is already creating the situation. 
So instead of your dog going for a punch, you want to replace it with, hi, can I shake hands with you or bump? You're replacing that punching with the bump, bumping or shaking hands. So therefore, the other dog says, oh, this guy has the skills, has the manners. I'm going to shake back. Does it make sense? I hope it makes sense. So you want to replace the unwanted behavior with the wanted behavior. That takes time. So pro proper exercise, proper training, and use those to improve the social skills of your dog. Thank you for your training sessions. I really enjoy them. We will, what would you recommend and how to train when the dog is reactive to other dogs? Okay, I just explained. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's repeated, that's why. Okay, HTM, oh, HMT, MTH, wow. Uh, my dog, a uh, staffy, after a good walk, we, we stop by a dog park always. Excitement gets high. My dog would play, then play rough. And when the other dog rolls on his back, my dog would be on him and grow. So I think I understand the problem that you're having. Uh, and I understand the situation. I think this, you know, this is something that comes from when your when your staffy was puppy. I'm I'm not sure if you allowed your puppy to mingle and play and socialize with other puppies and dogs. So this is a behavior of a dog who didn't have the opportunity or didn't have enough exposure when it was a puppy to play and you know mingle with other dogs and learn how to play and how to do things you know um, this is why for example the past 2 years that we have been going through this uh, pandemics the dogs didn't have the opportunity to socialize with other dogs and um, you know we call them pandemic dogs. They didn't have the opportunity to literally go and get involved with other dogs because of social distancing and such, such crap that we were going through. Um, so what we are noticing now are dogs who are lacking those social skills that I just explained a few minutes ago. They don't know how to greet other dogs. They don't know how to behave around other dogs. They don't know what how to play with other dogs, right? This is very important and very crucial that when you have a puppy starting at two months old or so, to allow your puppy to go and get involved with other dogs. Uh, you know, two, two and a half months, three months old, let them go and get involved with other dogs and allow those other dogs to teach manners and play skills to your dog, to your puppy. And if you don't allow them, then this is what happens, right? So I would suggest, now the damage probably is done, right? I would suggest making sure whenever you go to a dog park and there are other dogs, ask the other dog owner, is your dog uh, social enough to play with a dog who doesn't have the social skills? Because you don't want the damage to be done and then it's too late, right? So you wanna make sure that the other dog that is getting involved with your staffy has to that has the ability to teach your dog. You don't want, here's what I'm saying. You don't want your dog who's a student to play with another student. You want your dog to play with a teacher. Does it make sense? Because a student can't teach a student. 
A blind can lead a blind. You want to make sure that your dog is playing with teachers. Those dogs who can teach, who can tolerate and teach without damaging your dog and without being that type of dog that oh oh does that, right? You want to you want the other dog to stand up, but not to damage your dog. You have to find those dogs. You have to be very selective. Don't just let your dog be around any dog. Make sure that your dog is getting involved with decent dogs. That's what I mean. Next question is from Robbie. Thank you, Saro. I've been using your training method for the past week and it's made all the difference. I've noticed such a positive change in my Rippet's behavior, we will continue every day. Great, thank you. Oh yeah, Res, yes, I remember you now. You e sent me an email, Robbie. Right, right, I read the email. Yes, definitely, <coughs> definitely continue with the basics and then start increasing the level. Nola is just joining us, uh, trying to play catch up. <laughs> no worries. Um, um, next question is from Alina. Aline, uh, my bigo. Uh, oh, Yoko, can you translate that? Aline, is, is this Portuguese? Oh, this is Portuguese, and my wife knows Portuguese. So she's going to translate this question for me so I can answer it in English. Mi abigo foge de coleri nos pachea. Yeah, I don't understand it. Okay, the translation is my beagle escape from color. What's the best color? Hmm? Yeah, escape, escape, escape from color. What's the best color? Well, well, if your dog, your beagle, is able to escape from a color, that means you're you're not, you don't have a proper color and also proper adjustment. So I would suggest to use a a color called martingale color. Let me. I'll, I'll, I'll search the, well, let me show you what I mean. Uh, you have two options. Uh, let me share the screen. So you have two options. This is the color that I suggest. Okay, martingale color. Uh, oh yeah, I have. Uh, it, it's not a choke chain, but it's a martingale. I have one here, actually. So this is a martingale car. It looks like this, okay? So what it does, where is my dog? Okay, I'll use this dog. So here's the dog, right? He's wearing regular collar. So this is a regular collar, right? Um, this is a regular collar. So this regular collar has to be adjusted properly, first of all. So you see how nice and uh, uh, adjusted it is to this dog. It doesn't come off, right? And whatever I do, this collar is not going to come off. So you, first of all, you have to adjust it properly. Second of all, uh, make sure that the collar is nylon. It's not plastic or anything. Usually those plastic ones, they tend to slip. So that's your first choice, making sure the, the collar is nylon and is adjusted properly. The other choice that you have is uh, martingale. So martingale collar goes, you know, it has a big opening and it goes on the head, around the neck. But the only difference is if the dog pulls, you know, it kind of gets tight and you put the leash on this in here. You hook the leash on this. So here's a leash, goes there. Now I have a dog. If if it's if it's relaxed, it stays relaxed. If it pulls, it gets tight. 
So that would be your other option that, you know, you want to make sure that um, you're using um, martingale. Now, the other option would be a harness. Uh, what I mean by harness, uh, let me see if I can show you a harness as well. Uh, dog harness. Um, so you can use a harness as well. Okay. Uh, harness goes around the chest, right? Um, something like this goes around the chest. Uh, and you attach the collar uh, leash to the harness. And I, again, if you buy a good one, you should, the dog shouldn't be able to escape from it. And also you have to make sure that you're adjusting it properly. Uh, let's go to next question, which is from Nola. Uh, we are babysitting my sister's dog for four weeks shortly. How do we stop him charging out of the door and pulling us along at start of the walk? Have tried sitting him at the door, but not worked. When my puppy was your, your four months old, I think, my trainer chucked him in a pen with four staffies and a rottweiler nearly died did him the word of oh, good. So, I, okay, uh, let me answer this question. So, you're baby, babysitting a, for uh, a dog who tends to char charge out of the door and pulls on the leash as soon as you start the walk. So, the solution, first of all, would be you're, because you're looking after this dog for temporary and it's not your dog you shouldn't think that you have the you have to train this dog it's not your obligation your task i think at the moment when you get the dog is to take care of this dog to look after this dog and if you want to walk it there are certain things that you have to do before you go for a walk so if the dog has a hard time walking, you know, it's very excited to go for a walk and it pulls you on the leash. First of all, I wouldn't focus on the walk. I would focus on what do I do before the walk? Before the walk, you have to maybe stimulate the dog physically and mentally to bring that energy level from 100% to at least manage manageable percentage. 20, 30%, 10%, so you can manage it. So I will in invest, I don't know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, stimulating this dog, exercising this dog basically at home to bring the energy level down. So I have a way of managing this dog when we go for a walk. If you don't have the the a dog who's uh, learned how to walk properly is not your um, your duty to teach that dog how to walk. It's not your dog. I wouldn't suggest you to reinforce that to the dog because then you're going to stress your dog. You're going to stress yourself. Uh, it's not worth it. I'd rather not to walk that dog, but stimulate the dog beforehand and see how it goes. So let's say I played with the dog for 15 minutes and the energy level went down and then I put the leash on and we go for a walk and the dog still pulls. I would do half an hour. See that how that works, you know. Bring the energy level down, and then try the walk, right? Uh, in some cases, some dogs, 
when you exercise the dog, they get even more stimulated. They get not stimulated. They get the adrenaline kicks in and they get more excited. So you have to know that dog. You have to understand what kind of dog it is. <laughs> Do you what works and what doesn't work? That one of the best solutions is just to exercise the dog at home and hope that it's going to work when it goes for a walk. And, and also, you know, um, a dog who's pulling on the leash, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, put, depend on harnesses and tools and things like that. Instead, I would depend on bringing and controlling the dog, the, the mental level, to the mental level. Uh, one of my last, last videos, actually, I actually talked about it, uh, what to do with a dog who's pulling on the leash. Who's who's a pulley, right? Uh, let's let's see. Let me see if I can share the screen. Uh, with a good audio, so you can see it. So there it is. The dog. Who's a seeker and explorer, you know, and force it to walk like this, you're going to be causing a lot of physical, mental uh, issues first in your dog, your dog, and also in you, right? You're forcing yourself to get the dog to walk like this, which is not natural. So a seeker and uh, explorer type of dog needs to have that option of seeking and exploring. So the best thing is to loosen up the leash and let the dog just walk. So that would be my first solution, actually, to loosen up the leash, not to keep hold the leash too tight. Right? And do its own thing. Right? And second of all, invest in a long leash and let your dog to drag the leash. You can hold on to the end of the leash, or you have, if you have a little bit of control over your dog, can let the leash go and just let your dog do its own thing. Uh, she's choosing to walk beside me. She has the option of going wherever she wants. So there's another solution, you know, putting the leash, a uh, long leash on the dog and I mean, try to way. manage it that way. And right. let the dog drag the, the leash. You know what I mean? So those are two solutions that uh, you can you can work on. Few solutions actually, right? So hopefully uh, them help. Um, Next question is from HMTMTH. Uh, last question. Is it okay to play fetch with a group of dogs? Can I trigger rival, uh, rivalry that leads to resource protection aggression? Is it better to just walk in a group without any toys? Wow, this is a good question. Nobody has asked me this question before. I'm so glad that you brought this up, actually, this question and this topic. Yes, uh, I at the for example at the daycare that I run, uh, we play fetch, but I only play fetch with those dogs who are fetchers. What that means is they're not protecting the ball; they're not uh, possessive of the ball. They go. Their task is uh, their goal is actually to go fetch the ball and bring it to me. If I have those types of dogs, I play fetch with a group of dogs. If I don't have that type of dog who, who doesn't fetch and is very possessive with the, with the ball, 
either I um, either I uh, don't include them in the game or um, I only play with that dog uh, privately, right? Um, so that's one thing. I make sure that uh, the those dogs are not possessive with with um, with the ball, and uh, and if I have those kinds of dogs, they are not included in the game. And if I want to exercise those dogs who are very possessive, I play with them privately. Uh, plus, if if I'm going to play fetch with those dogs, the way I play it is I throw the ball and they go for it and I call them to come and drop the ball, make sure that they understand these rules, that when the ball goes, I go, grab it, bring it, give it to the human and wait for it to throw it. The other thing that I do is sometimes is I will get dogs to bring the ball and I'll ask them to sit and stay and I'll throw the ball and they can't move until I give them uh, the cue to go get the ball. And then once they, like for example, like this, right? Um, let me see if I can show you. So this is a puppy fetch game that I'm playing with this um, puppy, which is Annie. Uh, so we are, what we are doing is this is the, the, the training pre period. That's when I was teaching it. So once I teach the rules, I ask the dogs to rule, uh, follow the rules, right? So I don't usually, uh, I don't usually um, just play, uh, I don't just usually play, play only fetch and that. I put some rules in there, right? I, I, I ask the dogs to sit, stay, come. The stay is very important when you're playing fetch. Come is important too, because you want to make sure that the dog brings the toy or the ball to you. Uh, so that's very important. Um, if I see that these dogs are triggered by possession and aggression, I, I would just walk them, yeah, in group without any toys. Um, the other thing that I would say is, for example, in our doggy daycare, right? Uh, for example, in our doggy daycare, um, I we don't bring toys among the dogs, unlike other daycares, because what happens when you bring a lot of toys in the match, in the in the group of dogs, some of them are lacking social skills, some of them, they don't know how to play, some of them are possessive. It causes a lot of uh, bad behaviors to go around. So I don't, we don't bring toys. We want the dogs to learn to play and socialize together. That is more effective, more mentally and physically stimulating than with the toys. If you bring toys in the game, in the, in the, in the environment, the dog just focuses on the toy and forgets its surrounding, forgets in the, the environment where it is, forgets what it's supposed to do and how it's supposed to behave and focuses on toy, which is not a healthy thing. The last thing that I want you to remember since we are talking about this topic is the toy on its own has no meanings, has no feelings. The toy only has meaning when you get involved with the toy, if the human is involved with the toy. If there's no involvement with the toy, the toy, the toy has no value. There are dogs who will spend few hours on a toy on its own. Those dogs are damaged. Those dogs are not healthy. They're just focused and they're just obsessed with the toy, which is not healthy. 
your any no dog should be obsessed with the dog in the toy. All right, so if there is no other questions, uh, I, I think I would be ending the show today. Let me just quickly take a look. Uh, and Angie is asking, should I walk Ruby before or after dinner if it's close to dinner time? I've been walking her before dinner. This is a good question. Let me just touch on that. So if you if you go to, if you remember my formula, um, let me just quickly show you again. If you remember my formula, Exercise, training, socialization, care, and then affection. So you have to exercise your dog first, do some training, some socialization. The care is the dinner or breakfast or lunch or whatever it is. Uh, so the care comes after exercise. By understanding that, I think that answers your question. So care or feeding should come after physical and mental exercise and activity. Wow, we have a we have a five dollar super chat from Cynthia Ingram. Thank you so much. That is very kind of you. That is very nice of you, Cynthia. Let me know if you have any question. I will definitely answer your question. I don't know if there the the um, I don't know if you have asked the question you haven't asked and but you had the you had the kindness of donating to the channel and, and you know that is very kind of you thank you so much for the super chat um, is there any other question that I missed. Okay, there is another um, question from Nola. Uh, we've tried loosening the leash, great, it works, but can't do on a busy road and I, I live in a busy town. So if that's the problem, I would say, you know, put the dog in the car and drive somewhere that you can allow the dog to do that, to be free and be on a loose leash. You know what I mean? Uh, because Um, because, you know, I'd rather focus on quality than quantity. The quality of the walk should be great. So if you could give that opportunity to the dog to have a good quality walk without being stressed. Um, oh, you're saying you can't drive. <laughs> oh, okay. In your case, what I would suggest, hire a dog walker. You know, I'd rather focus on giving quality of walk to the dog than forcing myself and my dog to walk in an environment that is not <clears throat> suitable and it's stressing myself, me and stressing the dog. And you're saying, oh, well, but my dog has to go for a walk. I, I have. No, your dog doesn't have to go for a walk. Trust me. And I give you the permission to not to take your dog for a walk if your dog is overwhelmed with the environment. You don't have to walk a dog. I don't want you to understand that you shouldn't be exercising your dog. I don't want you to think that way. I want you to understand the fact that it's better to provide quality than quantity. Just because the media forces you and teaches you and to has told you that you have to exercise and walk your dog doesn't mean that you have to force your dog to go for a walk. If your dog is not enjoying the walk and it's stressful and it, it stresses it, it gets excited, it gets uh, stimulated, overstimulated, it gets uh, anxious, it's obviously better not to do that. Obviously, better to come up with another solution, another options. 
You know what I mean? Okay, so one last question and that's it, okay? And that comes from HMTMTH. Socialization, does it also mean a dog learning to interact um, with other dogs on leash or without free on walk to find it normal and do not react? So should it, does it mean, does it also mean a dog learning to interact with other dogs on leash or without it? Okay, good question. I see, I see what you mean. So the way you should train a dog is on a leash, on a short leash, long leash, longer leash, and then off leash. So that's how you're, you should be looking at training a dog. The dog should be having the skills to uh, greet another dog or not to react to other dogs on a short leash. If it does, if it learns that manner, then you extend the leash, and then you do longer leash, and then free on leash, off leash. Okay, that makes sense? I hope that makes sense. Because the reason, if you can't control your dog, on a leash, you won't be able to control the dog off leash. Although there are people who tell me, and I've seen dogs that say, they say the dog is good on leash, off leash, but on leash is not. That means that dog doesn't feel comfortable on a leash when it's attached to you. So that means you have a problem with that dog. Your relationship with that dog is not healthy. So you have to improve the relationship between you and your dog. So that doesn't affect your dog's behavior. If your dog is on a leash with you and your dog reacts to other dogs, that means there's a problem between you and your dog. But when you off leash, the dog doesn't, mis doesn't be misbehave. That means that dog, uh, that means you are the problem. So what is, what, what is it that you are causing your dog? You're causing stress in your dog. Why is it that you're causing stress in your dog? Because your dog says, I don't trust you. I don't believe in you when we are, you're attached to me. So your dog is making its mind, mind by, on its own. So you want to say to your dog, no, whether I'm here or not, you should be behaving properly. Whether you're attached to me or not, you should behave properly. And this is how we're going to do it whether you're on or off leash, okay? Uh, Cynthia has a question. Uh, how do you stop your dog from sniffing the ground instead of walking with his head up? That's called heal, healing. Heal command is a command that you teach your dog uh, to walk beside you without, um, without, you know, getting distracted by either the environment or uh, the, the, the people or other dogs. So I have a video on my channel. It's called How to Train Your Dog to Walk Beside You. So that, it's, a, it's something that I'm going to share in the chat area. Uh, it's called Heal Command. And I'm going to share that video in the chat area. Cynthia, uh, Cynthia, you can go and watch that. So that's how you're going to teach your dog to walk on a heel command. Um, the other thing that you can do is watch my upcoming video, which is on Tuesday. That I also teach you exactly how to get your dog to walk nicely on a loose leash beside you. So stay tuned on Tuesday. If you're not subscribed to my channel, make sure to subscribe to my channel to get notified. Also hit the bell icon as well. So you will get notified to when that video comes uh, um, com goes live. But I have a video where I teach and show how to heal, which is part of my online training course. Uh, I share partial part of it in this video. Um, with, it's not the whole thing, uh, but the full training, it's on my uh, training course itself. So yeah, that's that would be it. If you want to learn more and you want to join me and learn more about dog training and train a 
your dog without the use of treats, food, aversive tools, like shock collars, prong collars, choke chain collars, and without the force, domination, and being alpha. If you are local, join me in a private training. Uh, if you're not local and you want to um, learn the whole concept of dog training, join one of my online courses. If you have a specific problem, a, profit, a specific issue, you can use my virtual training, which is for everybody who is not local all around the world. This, uh, this is a, a method that I use to train dogs all over the world, including France, Italy, Germany, um, all countries around the world, China. Um, I have students from Finland. I have students from uh, Australia, England, all over the world. Fascinating. Uh, so, yes, thank you all for being here. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. I hope you got some ideas to start training your dog properly. And if you want to learn more and if you want to get some free content from me, go to saradogtraining.com slash free dog training basics. Get, uh, get started there. You'll have some ideas on how to start training your dog for free. Uh, and then... Um, There's something that I have to address at the end. I thought you preferred dogs to walk on loosely as heel cause problem. Yes, uh, I do. The way I ask the dog to walk on a heel by me is a loose leash heel. It's not one of those uh, soldier-like um, walks. Um, in my last video, uh, I, sh I showed an example. Um, that which is a no-no. Uh, let me see if I can teach you and show you that. Uh, just quickly, we're gonna do that this as well. Uh, so you have an idea. Hold on. Uh, there we go. So you see, to walk, walk beside, beside you, you, which is not natural. natural. It's, it's not. not um, um, this, this is, is what, what you, you want. want. You, you want, want your, your dog, dog to walk, walk like, like this, this, but you're, you're forcing the dog, dog to walk beside you, which is not natural. natural. It's, it's not. Um, it's not normal, normal for a dog, dog who's pulling on the leash. Welcome to Sorrow Dog Training Channel. So that's not the way you should walk. Uh, you should walk on a loose leash, which I'm going to show you next week how to walk properly on a loose leash. Okay, this is how it should be. That's how the wall should be, you know, loose leash on a heel, oh, yeah. still heel. That's still heel. You know, the dog is not pulling. The dog is walking by me, with me. That's still heel. So, yeah, I hope that clears your confusion. Uh, yes, healing is different. My heel is different than other heel dog trainings. My heel is a loose leash heel. And that takes time to train the dog and teach the dog which you need to spend time and energy to work on the dog, okay? So I hope you enjoyed this today's live show. I had fun. Thank you, everybody, and I'll see you next time. And until next time, have fun with your dog.